On this episode of A State of Control, we talk about the idea of no programming required solutions, whether it's a configuration or whether it's a fixed solution. These are commonly seen in the Cisco Touch 10 and the Zoom application. How are they impacting the world of custom control and control system programmers? All that and more on A State of Control. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. Nation. This is AV Nation. A State of Control. A State of Control, Episode 54. Friend zone. AV Nation is brought to you by Sure Sound Extraordinary. Welcome to A State of Control, an AV Nation podcast that highlights the control, programming, and automation aspects of the audiovisual industry. My name is Steve Greenblatt. I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. On today's show, we're going to be talking about the influence that fixed control appliances like the Cisco Touch 10 and dedicated apps like Skype for Business and Zoom are having on the custom control solutions offering and programming. So with me to discuss today's topic are some guests that I think are going to provide varied perspective and I'd like to welcome them in. Uh, First and foremost, uh, my partner at a state of control, his name is Rich Fergoza. Welcome, Rich. How are you today? Good morning. Mellow West Coast greetings. Obviously, it's a little bit warmer than uh, some of the climates you guys are in, so I'm I'm not going to complain about a little bit of drizzle. (laughs) And next, a friend and returning guest comes from Harmon Professional, and he is Chris Backus. Welcome, Chris. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate you having me on the show today. Glad for you to be here. And last but not least, it's been a while since he's been on the show back in episode eight. Um, His name is Scott Tyner, and he comes from Bates College. Welcome, Scott. Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to a a fun conversation today. As are we. Thank you. So as we discussed before, custom control solutions and control system programming are feeling the pressure from no programming required options. And some of those are in the form of the configuration, and those are being done because they're more economical, they're easier to deploy, they're, they're quicker to bring to market. And um, mo- more recently, we're also seeing the idea of limited or even no, con- no customization options in the form of uh, dedicated apps that run on touch panels. So let's dive in. And, and Rich, you know, we've t- discussed configuration before, and we, we've determined that there's a time and a place for it. And, and it really doesn't pose a threat if we put it in, into the right perspective. But when we talk about options that require no programming, uh, what does that mean for what we do and, and the, the future of uh, the, the custom market? Well, I think what, what first happens is that we immediately carve out the first 15 minutes of when we meet with somebody explaining that no programming doesn't mean no programming. So (laughs) that winds up being the first caveat, which is here's what you were told. Um, Now here's what we need to figure out is going to be deployed um, in your situation. I'm currently having some personal experience with this. I, I, what, what, we're, what we're finding is that, and we've talked about it before, we've been moving from uh, embedded or hard uh, contact points to, to softer contact points. You know, we're moving from hard codecs to soft codecs. You know, we're, 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 we're dealing with um, platforms that are, are definitely a, not, a lot more nimble than they've been in the past. I mean, we could expect that when a manufacturer released um, any kind of, of UC device, that there was going to be a, at least a, a significant shelf life and an EOL span that we could track and, and could kind of work within. And they'd say, hey, we're going to make incremental updates to this base that we have. Um, with software-based solution, there are companies who are willing to just say, yeah, that, that, that last version scrapped. We're doing it all over and it's better and faster and stronger. And so, um, Unfortunately, what they also wind up losing is a lot of that generational knowledge 
when they're um, deploying again. You know, they're, they're, they're literally at times trying to reinvent the wheel all over again and, and then rehashing the same mistakes that they've made before and coming back and going, oh, yeah, we have that. Well, you know, that's coming with a firmware update or a patch or, you know, uh, something else. And so what from our industry standpoint, um, how it's affecting us is that we are um, kind of going back to our roots where we are having to now in the soft field um, uh, write hooks in between where we did that all day long when it was a, a voltage or a serial device or a relay or an IO or something else. Now we're, we're dealing with it in terms of bridging bridge points for APIs. So, you know, how is it going to affect us? It just changes our model. I mean, but for less for the control prep programming industry and more for the integration industry, because we are now going to have to wind up being a, even more so an interface between that manufacturer is trying to handle an end to end solution and the end user. Um, you know, when, when there's 50 huddle rooms de de deployed, um, you know, that could be the IT, the, the IT team that's putting those in because those are all cloud managed. Um, and, and now you, you don't even necessarily have your same team who you've been used to working with for the past 15 years. Now you're coming in and you've got a whole new group um, who doesn't necessarily know you, doesn't necessarily know how you fit in to the process and you're having to re-educate them on it. So, it, you know, for, it comes back to education. I think what's happening is that we are, we are going to be required to communicate and exchange and educate um, a different group of, of uh, companies and individuals deploying the solutions than we have in the past. Scott, uh, I'll jump over to you as being uh, one of those people that Rich is talking about educating. <laughs> However, I, I believe these days that technology managers ha are very uh, much in the know and, and a lot of times asking the integrators and programmers specifically for what they want. Um, when it comes to to the, this type of a solution, and and, you, and you're looking at uh, weighing having a, a, a fixed application that that may be less customized and, and and more closed versus something a little bit more personalized, um, how, how do you go about making a decision like that? Um, yeah, and Rich, what Rich said is actually really really interesting, and I think that he. You, people in, in your role will be giving us some education about this, but I, I think that you're right in the sense that, if, particularly in education, we understand that faculty really want things the way they want them. And one of the things that Rich said about uh, no programming doesn't actually mean no programming reminds me of we have to, I, I'm a lot in the IT world over here as well, we have to constantly remind people that when that wireless takes a whole lot of wires. And it's, it's that same concept of, you know, oh, well, once everything's wireless, then we don't need ports in the wall. And we don't need to run wires in the building. And like, no, you, you actually do. And there's a, there's a degree to where people might have to learn this the hard way, right? Which is you put in um, a room that is a, a dedicated video conference room with a, a built-in system. And all of a sudden, somebody comes and says, but I want to do this in here. And you'll have to say, well, <laughs> when, we, when we talked about this room and you wanted to put in this amount of money into it, you you agree that we didn't want that now and that may be where i think rich was saying you you're going to come back and have to tie in this standalone system with that standalone system um so maybe just a, a completely different kind of programming that that you'll be doing from from what you're used to now uh, and i don't know how that interacts really a lot with the um the corporate world but in a in a educational institution um faculty really just want to walk into a room have it look the same way that they're used to having it look and have it just do what they want it to do Chris, uh, I'll uh, jump over to you from, from a manufacturer's standpoint. I could see the value in having out of box, out of the box solutions because it obviously helps to, to sell more product. Um, now, a lot of time and effort gets put into making those what they are and, and, and making them both user friendly and also easy to implement. Um, is there a a consideration that's put into how how much flexibility, how 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 much options, how many options to are, are provided to allow uh, expandability, like Scott is saying, because you you do probably have those situations where where a a, a static solution gets you in the door, but then there's a lot more that 
a client may want once they get to use the system. Right. No, that's a valid point. I think Scott brings up a really good point as far as an end user expectation for flexibility, right? And so if we looked at the market as kind of a pyramid at, at that widest point there of, of what most people are looking for and the, the biggest common application there, I think that defined experience fits in a lot of cases. As we, as we move towards the niche cases, that's where we have to start thinking about custom applications and a manufacturer that can play in both worlds and, and give you that defined custom experience. Um, or the defined experience, I should say, uh, as well as the custom experience, is probably going to be the most successful moving forward just because they've given options to the integrator to solve that small huddle space that might have no user interface or no control per se uh, to work with that standalone app, but then also offer an API that would allow for custom integration as we move. It's a platform to be used in both scenarios, uh, but you know, as far as what we're looking at, at providing the options to to have that flexibility from the API side is the most empowering to the integrator. I think if you look at you mentioned earlier in the in the call the the Touch Ten from Cisco, and I thought it was great when it first came out. A lot of people had some confusion, uh, and they they wanted to use the Touch Ten to to uh, interface with their Cisco codec, but then they wanted to have custom control in the room because they couldn't control the rest of the environment. Uh, and as we've seen recently with Cisco releasing that API uh, to allow for integration there. Now they have the ability to have the control system uh, perform a lot of those same functions that were once only possible with the Touch 10 interface, or vice versa, have the Touch 10 now communicate back to the, to, to the control system. What we've also seen on the residential side, we've seen the, the shift from, say, Sonos, for instance, that used to control their ecosystem and have it very locked down. And then the integration market said, hey, we, our customer demands a little bit more refinement and integration, and they don't want to hop between apps. So we need an API, and that's exactly what they released into the market. So I think we're seeing through others' actions kind of an affirmation that you've got to live in the middle of both of those to provide a, a user experience that is defined uh, as far as, as a manufacturer. Um, when that product goes into a space, uh, that has our brand on it. And, and it doesn't necessarily also say, in, you know, installed by uh, Rich Fergoza or any of the other partners in the industry, right? And so as a manufacturer, that's where we would care most about that experience to make sure it's going to be a great one. And if we're not sure about the partner that's installing it, we know that out of the box, it can have a fantastic experience. And then, then conversely, in the right hands with a, a custom integrator uh, that has some really good software tools and, and skills, they can take that experience and the hooks, like you mentioned, that we give into the product to have the ability to go ahead and create that, that further uh, furtherance of the experience to make a really great integrated solution. So again, living in the middle seems to be the success going forward. So Rich, uh, Chris talked about the the idea, as you mentioned, that that the there are hooks and 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 we're going from the static solution to the custom solution and 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 there needs to to be some consideration for expandability when i look at the idea of having apps that you have to switch between it it, it brings me back to the old days where you're looking at having a bunch of remotes and and we're almost i almost feel like we're going in reverse um what are your feelings about the user experience that something like that provides now granted you know the if you take the Cisco Touch 10 or even Zoom, one of the things that they do best is provide a very streamlined, simple, easy to understand user experience. But if you're having to toggle between that and another very independent system, are we really accomplishing that goal of making it easy for a user? Well, you know, we're seeing this more and more. I mean, again, we're, we're now to... Um it comes down to the space. I mean, keep in mind that, you know, 20 years ago, the technology made it cost prohibitive to have a huddle space, right? You know, you, you basically had a boardroom, um, you had maybe some meeting rooms and conference rooms, but you know, if you wanted to have a space for a three or four person meeting or a two person meeting and, you know, interconnected offices, maybe on the second floor and the 15th floor, um, they either all got together or, you know, you all had to schedule out and carve out time in the one conference room that could support it. Um, so, so, you know, we're dealing with an economy of scale here, too, where, you know, it goes back to, to, to clarifications. Right now, any, you know, any desk in the, the, that everybody has in, in their bullpen is technically a huddle space, right? You know, you could, you could have a conference and you could literally video conference to the person in the cubicle right on the other side of you if you wanted to, if you didn't want to see them. Um, and that poses a challenge, 
uh, because those are very specific. They have their own quirks. They aren't integrated necessarily into the lighting system or an overflow situation or uh, multiple displays or, you know, I mean, it, it just expands and expands. So it, it once again causes the, the, the conversation between um, purpose-built, you know, or single-use and integrated. And, and so that becomes the first question which is, you know, this space is a single use space. So, you know, does it need a lot of app switching or jumping around or, or anything else? Um, it, it now is, it, it, you know, you, this is where you get to stay with it. And it really wasn't designed to do other than a couple of basics. And I think the manufacturers are, are relatively clear about that um, in terms of what, what they are and are not doing. Um, and then the control system manufacturers are coming in and saying, okay, here's, here's what's available to us. Um, when you are dealing in an integrated space, I think the same still applies. Um, it's just very easy for people to have um, selective amnesia <laughs> when you talked about the dedicated space and then they walk into the integrated space and then they wonder, well, it, it worked just fine in this room. Well, yeah, you can only fit two people in the room and there was nothing else other than this codec and, and a screen. Um, and you know, you have a laptop input, not 14. Um, so, so, you know, again, it's, it's, it's scale. Um, and it comes back to like, we've been talking about it's education, that first step, which is, um, helping the, the end user understand what it is they have, you know, they, they collectively see, you know, what, what they've read in a spec sheet and how it should work without necessarily having the real world experience with it. And so then it becomes that guided tour of, okay, here's what you have. Here's what you can do. Here's the, the, the pitfalls of, of where you can find it. And, and these are where the items can, can fit in. Uh, you know, I mean, these standalone little touch devices, you know, a touch center or whatever, are great in very specific applications. Um, but once you leave that application, you're jumping through a whole lot of hoops that with a control system is what we've been doing for 30 years. Um, so it becomes the perspective conversation again. Scott, I, I, uh, I wanted to just kind of piggyback on what Rich said about the idea of having these dedicated spaces and, and, and again, um, establishing those ground rules. Is, is that, does that fly <laughs> in, in an environment like yours? And, and, it, and, and, and it, if that is the case where you have a dedicated space, but yet users are trying to do more, are they willing to, to understand that this is not what its purpose was and, and they have to, to, to maybe jump through some hoops in order to, to do some of the more advanced features that it could possibly do, but it really wasn't designed to do? Uh, so the, the short answer is no, that doesn't fly. Uh, and yet the, the, the longer answer is we, we deal with it all the time. As anybody, when we sit down and we design a room with, with uh, one of our internal clients, we really talk about what do you want to do, what's your budget, how do we accomplish this. Uh, but at the same time, many of our rooms here on campus have always been, whether they're meeting rooms, conference rooms, classrooms, uh, the same. You walk from one to the next, they're the same touch panel, they're the same systems, and you can just use them. And so as soon as somebody, really the only reason they, somebody would decide not to do that is about saving money. Uh, and so as soon as they've, they've made that decision and the room isn't the same, they, they're not happy. Or somebody else comes to use that room uh, and, and they're not happy. I think the other one that's interesting is, is I, I heard Rich talk and I was thinking we use um, Zoom a lot here on campus, even uh, just this morning, very cold up here in Maine, it's you know, six degrees. I didn't want to walk all the way across campus. So I popped open a Zoom conference and, and had a Zoom conference with somebody. And people are they understand that environment and they understand we might spend a, a minute or two. So, oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh, okay. I've got my microphone adjusted. But when they walk into a conference room or a meeting room, they don't expect that um, experience uh, and, and they expect it to, to work. Um, and, and really, I, I think that what it comes, this all comes down to is value. And I sometimes wonder with some of the, um, programming or consulting or designing we've done have we maybe kind of priced ourselves out of some of these things and that that people don't see the value we're giving them anymore 
in, in a unified system. And that also might have to do with age of, of, of people. Some of, some of the young, you know, younger generations, the 20 somethings may come in, you know, I don't, I don't mind hopping from app to app um, because it's, it's what I do on my phone or my iPad or whatever all the time. I th- think that you bring up a good point there. Uh, Chris, uh, one of the challenges that I see, and, and, you know, as we're rolling out a lot more of systems and one of the things that, that, that is the case is they still need to be managed and maintained and and whether it's an app whether it, whether it is a, a custom solution uh, obviously with custom solutions you you, you want to be able to to understand how many variations and flavors you have but it, but but when you're talking about some of these static solutions and apps you still have to worry about what's the latest version that's running um, what what are some ideas that you have to be able to to tackle something like that? Because I, I still think that part of the the you know that that challenge still is going to exist no matter which, which avenue you choose. Right, I, I think we've seen kind of a shift in the market for at least the the pro market here, where everyone's respecting now centralized management of devices and and kind of configuration management from the cloud, and and obviously. Most of the, the the vendors in this market space have had different solutions that allow you to to kind of monitor your inventory of the estate, so to speak, uh, and, and a number of those allow you to have that software revision come back. And, and so for first party devices, the Extron, AMX, Crestron, and things of that nature, you, you have the ability to see your own revs. But what it's going to place a burden on is, is having that information of those loaded apps uh, to understand what revs are on there. Uh, so for a device that might roll out uh, that could support third party apps, we need the ability to update them, obviously. And, and if for as large as some of these enterprises are, it, it's pretty critical that you have the ability to update um, those third-party apps that are on the devices as well in a centralized you know, global manner for uh, for ease of use and maintenance of the product and the platform. Uh, and so I think that's going to be important going forward. I, I'm not sure what capabilities already exist today for the other manufacturers, but I know that we're specifically looking at that um, as, as we roll out our, our Zoom app integration uh, within touch panels as well as within our other products like us and Core. So um, it, it's, it's pretty critical. Now, the interesting thing is as an industry, we realize we're still fairly niche and, and a little small. And, and admittedly, Zoom does not check with us to make sure it's okay to roll out an update, right, that could potentially uh, break a, a few systems that we're going to get calls about. Um, but it's provided we give them tools to be able to, you know, mass upload uh, changes to their their entire estate or their inventory uh, that's deployed. I think that's going to be the key to success for manufacturers because we know we're not going to get consulted, but we have to give people a way to rapidly respond to, to changes in the in the app ecosystem. Scott, I'll, I'll come back to you because I I'm curious how so so when when you have systems that are, 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 are custom programmed, you know that they're not going to change unless somebody changes the programming. But as Chris said, the, uh, manufacturer or software provider can roll out an update and, and change the way uh, a system operates. Is that okay? Um, and, and, how, and, and, and has that become something that, that you form a relationship with, with that software provider to understand what is their roadmap what, and, and, and be able to help to anticipate updates coming in? Because it, if they want, they could actually change the way a system works, never mind, not wor- not, never mind break something, but even you can walk in one day and, and the system can operate differently. Right. Uh, well, I would love to say we could form these relationships, but I think like uh, Chris pointed out, I don't, I don't think Zoom is going to be calling us to talk to us about certain updates or any, any big company really. And it, it's interesting because I, I think what we see is there's always uh, a, a give and a take, right? So we, we, so we save some money, we, we deploy this thing easily, we put it in a classroom uh, or a meeting space. But then we have to change how we support that. So now somebody on, on my team needs to then on, on a weekly basis or whatever, go to these websites, check out what their roadmaps are, check out what their plans for updates are. And it, it could break a system. It could change how the system works. It could simply just change the interface. And all of a sudden, our, our customers are calling us because they don't know how to react to this interface. So yeah, we, we save some money maybe when, when we go in and deploy it quickly and, and inexpensively in a room. But then the, the support end is a much bigger piece. You think that perhaps any piece, any one of these software companies uh, may do something like uh, a Windows does, which is allow us to control those updates. But all of a sudden, when you do that, you're you're moving more and more into this enterprise piece, and more and more really, and that's a, a form of customization, letting us decide when to update. 
Um, so it, it's actually something I hadn't really thought about till, till Chris started talking about that. And it is a, um, it's an, it's an interesting piece that we have to learn to, to keep our eyes on. Rich, I'll, I'll uh, kind of bring things to a head with you. Um, we we know that 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 this isn't going to be the end of the world, but it it actually is a new way of thinking. Um, from a programmer's perspective, how, how should they be prepared to live in this new world of of integrating apps and 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 trying to still demonstrate value, as Scott had said before, to to and 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 be that go to resource that they once were. Well, I mean, on, honestly, it, it, it's, if you're new, seek out the guys who have been doing it for 25 years because you're, going, you're starting all over from a software standpoint what we had to do 25 years ago, which, which is a matter of saying, we're going to figure it out as we go. You have to be a jack of all trades and master of all. Um, and so, um, you know, if you want to be successful – much like everybody started out in this industry from a control system standpoint, you get to learn how to be a subject matter expert on everything. You have no choice um, because your responsibility is not only to figure out your control system, but as we've been doing forever, figure out where the flaws and the gaps and how to get from here to there occur between the other. Um, it does require um, opening up your um, uh, your your thinking to the fact that there aren't many other software development tools other than the control system software that you're working with. So you have to be willing to either collaborate, hire, or learn um, all of those other um, software hooks in between. So if it, if it does become a matter of, I mean, we're seeing that now even with our own control manufacturers, right? You know, if you're, if you're not spending time um, with the more established um, software languages um you're going to need to start figuring that out if you're not uh, if you're not necessarily on the uptake on you know things like authentication and uh making sure that um you you have secure connections which is completely different than an unsecure connection that we've been dealing with forever i mean when we first rolled out the first pieces i mean if you know 99 times out of 100 admin admin you were controlling pretty much everything and and called it a day you know i mean it we we're no longer in the day of you know of admin colon admin right you know username password where you can get into everything um so so you know it it is it's, it's a good lesson. I mean, it's, it, again, it's from my West Coast vibe. Just embrace the Zen, man. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be there. Um, and, and if you love learning, um, this is the right industry to be in because you're constantly going to be doing it um, and spending your time researching and going on the interwebs and picking it all up. Uh, it, and so there's some beauty in that. Um, and I think the fact that we are seeing APIs, and even though all of them are different, at least we are having a, a communication standard where we, we are over HTTP, you know, or HTTPS. And, and so at least it's getting there. It's getting closer. And, and we can at least communicate with manufacturers and say, it would be really nice if you could give this to us. And even if they can't give it to it, at least you know that it doesn't require seven different hardware changes in a chipset or something else. You know, you know that you might be able to talk them into it, into making a software rev, which at least is a bit more nimble in terms of the response and, and you know, and the call and callback to to them. And so, uh, I'm excited for it. Um, you know, again, in residential, you know, I mean, obviously we we are now doing our fair share commercial, but in residential, I mean, HomeKit is supposed to you know, just decimate the industry for three years now and people still can't turn off their lights half the time. So, you know, they're great ideas until the manufacturers who wind up bleeding money on it decide they're not great ideas anymore. Uh, and somebody's got to be there to pick up the piece. So, you know, I'm, I, you know, I, I guess automation has to be used to being in the friend zone. You know, <laughs> we're, 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 we're the friend zone of UC. Uh, you know, we're never quite the one that they first pick, but they always come back to us to cry on our shoulder. So, you know, be happy in the friend zone. I think that's a great way to wrap this up. <laughs> so with that said, I'd like to thank my guests for being on today. Uh, first, uh, Chris Backus from Harmon. How can people find you, learn more about Harmon Professional and also the education offerings that you're involved in? 
Thanks again, St uh, Steve, for having us. Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at avcontrolguy or uh, LinkedIn is a great place as far as Harmon Pro. Uh, it's just pro at harmon.com. And for all things training, you can always reach out to traininghelp at harmon.com. And hopefully we can guide you to where you uh, can find the information for what you're looking for. Wonderful. And Scott Tyner, thanks for being with us. Uh, next time we're going to make this a lot shorter and I uh, had some real valuable contribution. Uh, what, uh, how can people find you, learn more about what you're up to? Uh, you can find me on either LinkedIn or on Twitter at S Tyner. And uh, certainly one thing I get out of today is I'm, I'm looking for some of that uh, West Coast vibe and, and warmth that Rich has got over there. And also, just to, for the audience, you're often on uh, the EdTech podcast from AV Nation as well. So uh, catch him there. And last but not least, Uncle Richie, another great show today. How could people get in touch with you and learn more about what you're up to? Uh, you can find us on the interwebs, um, uh, fragosadesign.com. Uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter, at rfragosa. Uh, but hopefully, most importantly, find us here on AV Nation, here at the State of Control. We also have Resi Week, AV Week, and, and, and lots of other great shows. So that would be the best place to find us. And, and that's where you enhance your Zen, brother. So <laughs> You got it. <laughs> Couldn't say it any better. Uh, for me, uh, my name is Steve Greenblatt. You could reach me uh, at Steve Greenblatt on most social media platforms, or you could visit my company website, Control Concepts, at controlconcepts.net. But as Rich said, most importantly, check out AV Nation at avnation.tv to find this show, the weekly shows, the monthly shows, and get all that you need to know about uh, the industry events and and uh, the, the news of the industry. While you're there, uh, please check out the supporters that for State of Control.